Um, I just have a few slides. I, I was saying at lunchtime, my brain is such that I see, I, I learn in pictures much better than words, so I'm going to use words and pictures. And the first picture is this brain that uh, is illustrating how important to, to really bring about the transformation that we're talking about. We really need to be using the, both the right and left sides of our brains. We need to be thinking clearly and we need to be using our creativity. Um, so I'm an outsider. I haven't been to the Poughkeepsie area for 35 years. So like I know nothing about you except a little bit of digging that I've done. So it's, it's kind of fun to be an outsider looking in and, and I'll be curious to see what kind of reactions you have. So let's, I, th I have a few numbers around Dutchess County that I want to start with because I'm a CPA by training. So I always love to play with numbers. Um, there's about 300,000 people that live in this county. I, so that's, okay, so what? <laughs> well, if you take the, the average spend on health care for the region and for the country, um, you all spend $2.4 billion a year in this county on health care. Did you, did you know that? $2.4 billion a year. And um, plus, that doesn't even count the additional money that you spend for social services, um, housing services, other human services. So it's a, it's a pretty big check. And uh, we spend in total $2.5 trillion a year on health care in this country. We spend twice as much as is the average of other developed countries, twice as much. And so, and it's really creating this uh, drag on the economy, not that, that health care doesn't create jobs, but it it's creates a competitive disadvantage for companies in the, in the rest of the world. So I'm from Detroit. I live in Seattle, but I'm from Detroit. And I grew up loving cars, and I, I subscribe to Car and Driver and Motor Trend. I still read them every month. And one of the things that you may or may not know is that if you buy an American car, a car from an American car company, there's $2,500 of healthcare costs in that car. And if you buy a car from a foreign car company, there's $500. There's a $2,000 differential. And it, it's really quite a problem. But another factoid is 30% of what we spend on healthcare is waste. And if you look at what the waste is, it includes things like unnecessary services, excessive admin costs, Prices that are too high, inefficiently de delivered services, fraud, and misprevention opportunities. So I'm sitting here and I'm like tucking myself into getting really depressed, right? It's like, oh my gosh, we spend so much, there's all this waste. But then I realize, no, wait a minute, this represents low hanging fruit. Because if we can free up this money, we can, we can take the same amount of money that we spend now. And we can do like amazing things. Because in, in my perspective, what we have in this country is not a health care system. We have a sick care system. And what I mean by that is money doesn't start flowing in large quantities until after you get sick. We spend only 2 to 3% of our spend on prevention. We need to be spending 30% of our health care dollars on, on prevention, not 3%. The, People, there's a wide consensus that that's where we have to go. So, so again, I'm thinking about health versus health care. And if you start thinking about what helps people move towards health, what are the determinants of health, what determines health, health care only represents 10% of what determines health. Behaviors, social environment, genetics represent the rest of the pie. But we're spending all of our money well, on the, on the sick care slice, not even helping people stay healthy, we need to be spending twice as much on primary care in this country. We need to have enough funding for behavioral health so that everybody who has a behavioral health disorder who could benefit from care actually has care available because there's adequate funds. So I'm thinking about, I'm coming back to Dutchess County. There's this great uh, website, County Health Rankings, and they have rated every county in the country. Of the 62 New York counties, you actually do pretty well in two areas, health outcomes and health factors. You're ninth in health outcomes and 10th in health factors. What would be really cool, if
if you decided you wanted to be first in both of those things. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how you might go about getting from number 9 and 10 to number 1. Oh, I don't remember, but I'll look it up. Um, after, when I go back to my chair, I'll plug in my computer and I'll tell you. I forget who's number one. So, so this is a, a breakdown of some of the measures. Uh, health behaviors inth include things like smoking and excessive drinking and sexually transmitted infections. Uh, clinical care includes how many primary care docs, how many preventable hospital stays there are. Social factors include unemployment, inadequate social supports, children in single parent households, violent crime rate. Physical environment includes things like access to recreational facilities, fast food restaurants. You notice that I read all the things that are read because those are areas where you're 20% worse off than the average of the, of the nation. You're 20% worse off than the average of the nation where I listed the 10 things. We'll, we'll post these slides on the website. So it, it's not just about having more money for primary care. It's about thinking about how to spend the money to help people move towards health, whole health. And, and so, well, we're, where are we going to get that money? We're, you know, there's such shortages. There, you know, things are being cut. The entitlements are being attacked. Well, well I have some really great news. Um, and well, first let me say that this is your money. Have you ever thought about that $2.4 billion a year that, that you all spend in Dutchess County is your money? It comes, it comes from your taxes. It comes from your employer paying your health premiums. It comes from your out-of-pocket care, out-of-pocket payments. But, but we live in a country where we have virtually no control over that that. Well, in your case, $2.4 billion a year that gets spent on, on health care. What would happen if, we, if, we ha if this community organized itself to have more control, to start exerting more control over how that money was spent? And there are two major opportunities. The first is Medicaid expansion and, and the health insurance exchange are coming online in 2014. There's going to be approximately 30,000 people who live in this county who are currently uninsured, who are going to get on Medicaid simply because they're poor, or they're going to buy coverage through the exchange uh, with subsidies, because there will be federal subsidies to pay for part of uh, your health insurance on a sliding scale. And that's going to bring, this is a typo, there's three missing zeros in here. <laughs> There's 150 million, there's approximately $150 million of new money, most of it's federal money, that's, that's been paid for by the way the Affordable Care Act was set up, to, that's coming into this community, new money, to fund the health care, to pay for the insurance premiums for those 30,000 people that are uninsured. The question is, how do you want that money to be spent? Because those people are already in the community and they're already showing up in the emergency room, getting care, showing up in the hospitals. The other thing that's happening is if you go back to that 30% waste, remember that, that statistics? If you, if that's, six, that's $700 million a year of waste, okay? Oh, my God. And, and if you said, we're going to take 10% of that waste, we're going to figure out a way to free up 10% of that waste, that's $70 million that you could, I would suggest, program. In addition, there's $200 million that's, that I believe could be made available to actually fund the kind of transformation work that we're talking about today. And, and so how... How did you get to so, so spending per person is about $7,800 on average when you take people on Medicare and Medicaid and private insurance times the residents. Time, is that's the $2.3 billion a year you spend. 30% of that is waste, which equals that, it's the $687 million. If you were able to free up 10% of the 30% of waste, that's $70 million a year that you could spend on the programs that you're working on. And there's what, so Dr. Hotspot, he's freeing up money that the idea is to re, to hotspot folks to free up the, 
the money and to reprogram that into the kind of community interventions that he was talking about and that you're talking about. This is how we spend the money now. If the local community were to get organized to influence how the new money was spent and, and tackle the waste, how would you prioritize spending the 200 plus million dollars? Look at, look at how it's spent now. Again, you can look at these slides. I want to say two ideas before I sort of we shift, move, move on to the next topic. Uh, I believe that the future is not in primary care clinics. It's not in getting primary care in emergency rooms. It's actually not in medical homes. It's in one-stop health and wellness centers. In Fulton County, Georgia, which is where Atlanta is, is doing this amazing stuff. They are creating these health neighborhoods that contain one-stop centers where people go and they get a holistic set of services under one roof. The first one, they've got four of them under development. The first one's the Neighborhood Union Primary Care Clinic. I did site visits to two of them a year ago. This is in inner city Atlanta, uh, just outside of downtown. And look what's in the health neighborhood one stop. Well patient care, sick patient care, OBGYN, traveling immunization, communicable disease intervention, WIC, nutrition education, oral health, behavioral health services, and employment assistance, disability and voc rehab, foreclosure prevention services, housing assistance. What's happening around the country is people are creating these one stops customized for the needs of the neighborhood. So, so this was their first one. If we go to the second one in North Fulton County, they have everything in the first, in the first one stop, plus look what else they have. A daycare center for the children and parents receiving services, a branch of the public library, a reading room information center that offers English as a second language classes. You can pay your parking tickets and taxes. Talk about one stop. And they have a farmer's market, a community garden, and a really fabulous set of walking trails. Okay, okay, so we're talking about Imagine Duchess. Where my brain is going is how many one stops do you, how many almost one stops do you already have? How many one stops did you used to have that didn't make it for whatever reason? How many one stops do you want to have? Because what happens is it doesn't matter whether you're, you're poor or rich or have behavioral health disorders or not. You know, we all get traumatized by how many different doors we have to go through to get our needs met. And, and so this idea of creating under one roof or virtual one stops through technology is a very, very powerful intervention to actually fix the healthcare system. One other thing I want to talk about, so, so the, I think the future is going to look like one stops with services located in places like assisted living facilities, schools, community centers, apartment complexes, behavioral health specialty clinics, lots of mobile teams. You remember Brenner talking about those community-based teams? I predict that counties that really make the right decisions about how to spend that new money are going to be pushing a lot more people out into the field. We're moving back to an era, is that how you say it? We're moving back to an era of, of home visits of doctors and nurses doing home visits to people where, that where it's difficult for them to come to the clinic. The last thing I want to say is Paul Farmer, who many of you have heard about from Partners in Health, who's been working in Haiti and other places for 30 years, he just came out this summer, co-authored a really cool argument called Realigning Health with Care Lessons and Delivering More with Less. We need a broader definition of who provides care, he talks about, with a major effort to expand the use of paraprofessionals, health coaches, community health workers, and peers. Okay, so here's the deal. If you go to Europe and you ask a simple question, take all the docs in a given country in Europe or the whole continent, how many of them are primary care docs, how many of them are specialists? It's half and half. If you go to the US and you say how many are specialists, how many are primary, are primary care docs? A third of them are primary care docs and two-thirds are specialists. Did you know that? And so well, people aren't able, so if you are able to get a primary care doc, I don't know what your experience is like, but most of us where I live, we have like 10 minute visits because the pay is so little, the payment rates are so little that the docs are having to churn them out and you can't really get it, you don't have time to have the kind of experience that Derek was having with Kathy. And so, 
But the other, there's another piece, not just the primary care docs, but the specialists. But the thing that really blew me away that Farmer talks about is we are the only country where there is not a robust number of paraprofessionals that are part of the healthcare team. We, we have so much fewer health coaches, community health workers, peers that are involved in the delivery of care. And a very powerful, if I, if I think about that $150 million coming into the community, where the heck are you going to get enough doctors to provide that extra care? The answer is actually not in, in bringing in, trying to find a whole lot more doctors. It's actually diversifying your workforce so you move from individual care to team-based care in every setting where, and, and you dramatically increase the use of health, I'm saying, I'm repeating myself because it's so important, health coaches, community health workers, and peers. And I think these two innovations, I just want to plant these ideas in your head as you're cooking up your, your future design. And, and I want to leave you with, oh my gosh, $150 million more money coming in uh, starting in 2014, plus, plus $700 million of waste is a lot of, a lot of money to tackle the kind of challenges that you're talking about. So don't, don't come at this with a poverty consciousness um, because you, you really have more money than that. So that's, that's what I wanted to say. Um, how did I do on time? Did I go over 15 minutes? So, so let me see if anyone has any questions or comments, because I am tired of listening to myself talk all the time. Yeah. The one-stop uh, shop, is it the, the two examples that you, you yeah. indicated, are they run by the county, run by the, how, how, who manages, who, who puts them together? So in Fulton County, what they did was they said, um, they, these are county buildings, and there's, they invited partners to come in. So the primary care services in one, uh, in the first one, was a federally qualified health center. Uh, the primary care services in the second one was Brady Hospital's primary care clinic. They've invited in uh, social, ser uh, uh, community nonprofit organizations, um, social service agencies, um, other county departments. It's this great partnership. So they've, they basically opened the doors, they invited people in and for lower, low rent or no rents. Each entity there is, is independent or it's, it's all coordinated by one organization? So we brought the head of, um, of the county, uh, this you know, Health and Human Services, to uh, Chicago this spring to, to give a talk on her project and somebody asked her that question. And she said, you know, um, we're really, this is, this is the first step. Co-location is not integration. You can put people in the same building and they can never talk to each other, right? And so this, your question is a beautiful question because it's the next step for them is to create a single electronic health record that everybody shares and to, get, and to change the workflows so that people actually are interacting with each other even if they're from different organizations in the building. Changing the workflows so that if I do, if I'm a doc or a nurse practitioner, I do a screening, and I for behavioral health disorders and identify a potential disorder, I part of my workflow will be to walk down the hall to the person who has, um, who's the behavioral health specialist, and have them do a full assessment, if if the client is interested in that. So it's your question is like critically important, especially now with having. 30 million more people coming on, on board with no yeah. a, additional physicians. Uh, we all have to be prepared yeah. that the services are going to move from, uh, from a medical uh, qualified MDs to, to, to less than a medical. It doesn't mean that it's less good, but we have to be prepared in order to be able to care for all the amount of people we're going to see actually a, a lowering of the standards that the requirement and if that's not going to happen then the whole system will never work oh so so let me let me use a few words about that um, there's a ter how many of you have heard the term practicing at the top of your license okay so this is a really important concept in terms of what you're talking about because right now uh, 
the way the typical medical visit goes is you go into, you schedule an appointment with your doctor because it's not team-based care and there's no assessment of who you need to really see. And, and, if you're, and what we want to do is create team-based care so that doctors really only field the appointments where they're, where they're the right person, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, nurses, uh, social workers, peers, health coaches, if you take 100 visits in a given week in a clinic, not all 100 of those visits, most of the cases, 100 of those visits are trying to be squeezed into 10-minute slots with the docs. And if you have team-based care, you provide people working at the top of their license, high-quality care. If somebody needs a doc, they get to see the doc. If they, if they can do better with the nurse or the nurse practitioner, uh, which actually is the case a lot of times, is doing better with the nurse than the doc, then that's who, you, that's who the scheduling works. So that's how the change is happening in communities that are better using the workforce and it's actually better care for people. And, and the docs are much more happy with the, the, the jobs that they're doing. If we could assume for a moment that um, we as a group reduced inpatient hospitalizations or ER visits by X percent, yeah. how does the money come back to the county? It's the first part. And the second part is who determines what to do with that money? The first one is if, if it, let's just talk about the Medicaid system. If you reduce inpatient hospitalizations and emergency room visits in the Medicaid system, the health plans that are, have, that are managing the Medicaid system save money. Uh, not that money, and so what's happening in other communities is there's a community effort to get the health plans to this table to say, uh, <coughs> we're gonna work on hot, we're gonna create a community-wide project to hotspot. We're going to, we, we are confident that we can, and you create very conservative projections, we can save this much money, and they get agreements from the health plans and the BHOs, if you can bring down psychiatric inpatient, to funnel that money into these innovation projects that will further bend the cost curve. And so what's happening in other communities is progressive health plans are at the table, they're they're, they're taking those savings and they're pushing most of them back into the budget of an organization like this. But see, this isn't an organization, this is a group of people. What's happening around the country is they're, create, they're basically creating an entity like this that it's a community-based entity with a community board that says, let's decide the innovative projects that we're going to work on. They start with grant money. Where's the one? Jennifer. They start with Jennifer. And, and other organizations to, to get the thing off the ground and grants from the BHOs and from the health plans. And, and if they're successful, they, those grants become an, in, an upward spiral of freeing up dollars that then a chunk of those dollars gets fed back into the system to create this really cool set of increasing funding for innovations to, to basically create the kind of healthcare ecosystem that's not a secure system, it's a healthcare system. That's what happens. That's what's happening around the country. Um, I'm going to keep looking to them and they can shut me up at any time. Uh, Ann? 20 years ago when HMOs first came in, Dutchess County, it was called CHP? Mm -hmm. CHP. Mm -hmm. It was an old school, actually, and they did what you, at least from a medical side, they put everything in there. And I remember I, I used to go there. And I saw a nurse practitioner there yeah. who I actually preferred to see to my doctor. But that failed. And I, I don't know, did that fail, did that model fail all around the country? And was there a reason that it failed? Or, or you won't know the answer to this. Was our CHP particularly bad and that's why it failed? <laughs> but if the model failed, why will it succeed this time? What's different? Uh, what, let me just say that uh, uh, 20 years ago, um, like Group Health, where I live, which was a similar to that, they, uh, they took their eye off the ball of great primary care, and they didn't have their eye on the ball of becoming a hospital and emergency room prevention organization. So when they built projects like this, 
they underfunded them and they didn't and they didn't focus on hot spotting and so they 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 didn't they didn't tackle the right people in terms of wrapping cure around them so their costs kept going up and up and they became known as group death <laughs> can you imagine being a, a HMO and getting that nickname and but they've turned it around and and in the last 10 years they they have taken another run at this and they've they're creating a true healthcare system they're seen as one of the leading uh, organizations in the country to turn this around and and I bet if you deconstructed what happened if you did sort of a Monday morning root cause analysis you would be able you'd probably see similar things that happened with group health which is there's probably 12 things they did wrong that they could learn from their mistakes now